Everest is closed. As a mountaineer and someone who has made six expeditions to climb Mount Everest and thankfully returned from its summit without coming to any harm and without harming anyone, I am happy about this. The mountain needs a break and there needs to be a big reset button pressed on how climbing this mountain should be reshaped. The enforced hiatus will help its environment and for now it will stop the images of overcrowded dirty base camps, the ridiculous queues to the summit and the tragedy of frozen corpses holding a shameful mirror to the cost of human endeavour. Summiting Everest is a dangerous endeavour and high altitude mountaineering is a thrilling and challenging sport which I love. In 25 years now of travelling to high and remote places, I'm constantly reminded of the words of Rachel Carson, whose book Silent Spring I carried with me. Those who dwell among the beauties and mysteries of the earth are never alone or weary of life. But I never looked out of the tent door up at the summit and imagined getting there at all costs. For me, it was and always has been about the aesthetic of the climb, the manner and the integrity of the endeavour. And I've taken that attitude with me into my tourism business as well. René Dumal puts it this way in Mount Analog. After all, you cannot stay on the summit forever. You have to come down again. So why bother in the first place? Just this. What is above knows what is below. But what is below does not know what is above. One climbs, one sees, one descends. One sees no longer, but one has seen. There is an art of conducting yourself in the lower regions by the memory of what one has seen higher up. When one can no longer see, one can at least still know. Ultimately, the summit of Everest is a piece of real estate five miles high in the sky with an amazing view, but if all it represents is a selfish individual attitude to conquering or winning, a bit like the endless pursuit of growth at all costs, then nothing has been learned. For me, the endless traveling and climbing brought about an important journey in my perspective on life. And even that is now still constantly changing. My father always told me I had twice as many ears as mouths, so I should listen twice as hard. Sometimes a spectator sees more than a player in the heat of the game. But some of my expeditions to Everest were particularly difficult. I climbed several times without bottled oxygen, with fewer camps and with no support infrastructure. Twice I climbed by myself and uh, completely sort of self-reliant on my own experience and knowledge and decisions. It sounds a bit dramatic, but Personal encounters with mortality are life-changing, and to continue the mountaineering metaphor, societal encounters with mortality and our mortal vulnerabilities similarly have the potential to transform the life of society. Shared adversity fosters an affinity with others, an appreciation of the world we live in, and moments where we fully realise that we are not invincible, individually and collectively, are profound. And yet, there's been a collective reluctance to face that fallibility of our human condition and not facing up to them is not good for society. The damage that we have done has not been recognised for what it is and who is providing the perspective. We are a species that likes to break its legs on its own cleverness. As the American poet uh, Robinson, Jeffers says, Robinson Jeffers said, Maybe politicians and world leaders should climb mountains. Maybe the experience would bring them closer to the people after coming too close to death to enjoy the arrogance of power any longer. Confucius said, We have two lives, and the second one begins when we realise we only have one. Looking down from the highest point in the world was my moment for understanding that. But now Nepal is closed, 
and I am conflicted. As the owner of a guiding company, earning my living from sending tourists to trek and climb among the highest mountains in the world, I am more aware than most of how this complex, multifaceted Everest climbing industry supports thousands of jobs, including my own. Will this expose an hypocrisy in my values? Countrywide, a million livelihoods will be affected, not just mountain guides, but all the people who work directly and indirectly in tourism, in the shops, the restaurants, the hotels and tea houses, transportation and all the tourism-related businesses which are so key to Nepal's economy. It's just an example of the bigger existential crisis facing us, the one we haven't properly phased up to in the race for business as usual. The future for humanity is grim as the crisis spreads like the wildfires we watch on TV around us. Melting glaciers, rising temperatures, dwindling rainforests and vanishing topsoils, yet still we buy, fly and multiply, a human population forever gobbling and using everything up. Jeffers coined the word inhumanism, the belief that humankind is too self-centred and too indifferent to the astonishing beauty of things. But this is not new, of course. In 1962, Rachel Carson wrote, The human race is challenged more than ever before to demonstrate our mastery, not of a nature, but of ourselves. It makes me think of Jean-Jacques Rousseau's theory of the noble savage, symbolising the innate goodness of humankind before being exposed to the corrupting influences of civilization, Or... Are we just amoral savages, uh, motivated by self-interest, as Thomas Hobbes suggested? We weak-minded humans who need the constraints of a social contract to restrain us from anarchy. Some people watching the pictures of climbers stepping over dead bodies to summit Everest would say he was right. Up there in the innocuous atmosphere at 8,000 metres, with mental acuity reduced to an instinctive response, could it be that morality and human kindness is just a veneer for an otherwise selfish and nasty human nature? This is a crucial paradox to hold in tension as we consider the more chronic global challenge of a pending environmental catastrophe, which of course we contribute to through tourism. I'm happy that Everest is shut, and I'm scared that Nepal is closed and I'm conflicted. I'm conflicted because I want to live in a world to be like Henry David Thoreau's Walden, another book which kept me going through 11 years of wandering. As a mountaineer and traveller, I have a strong emotional reaction to wild places and the world beyond the human. When I was 21, I walked alone across the Sahara Desert, and as I passed between sanity and insanity throughout those six months, I achieved some oneness with my environment, a learning about how to survive and a deep appreciation for the Tuareg people who call the desert their home and live according to its code. That expedition had me embark on a life of travel and adventure and for 11 years I lived nomadically. It was a hand-to-mouth life of intoxicating experiences and adventures and revelations. But nowadays... I sometimes wonder if I've become reliant on a tourism business that is part of a nihilistic capitalism. Endless growth is not compatible with a finite planet. We are exhausting our planetary resources and generating profound social injustice and violence, exploitation and oppression. That's why I share the profits of my company with the local people who run my holidays. It's my minuscule fight against the machine. There's a word for this stress or should I say distress at the world we live in and the sense of being complicit through a kind of resigned acquiescence. Solastalgia describes an unease that the natural environment around you is changing for the worse. Every time I go back to the places I've loved all my life, the mountains that have enlightened me, all I see are retreating glaciers and hordes of people. Half a mile down the valley from Everest Base Camp is a giant pit where all the shit from the climbers is dumped by porters who charge by the kilo. Now all I have is disenchantment and a desire to withdraw. All I want is my acre or two, a wooden house in the forest, some bean rows, a pasture, a view of the river, a place to bring up my children and enjoy the simple pleasures, feel the sun on my back. Our Walden. 
And if now is the time for radical reform, then it's probably too late. Carbon emission initiatives, industrial wind and solar energy, green architecture, climate accords and ecotourism don't propose an alternative model for the end of capitalism. Maybe rewilding does. And yet, we can't just give up and accept that it's all meaningless. I'm not a nihilist. I have to believe that our actions may not be totally ineffectual, that we can manage to stick with the cause that something is better than nothing. Hobbes' social contract is based not just on self-interest, but on the premise that only by working together, by cooperating and helping each other out, can we survive. We need to share our doubts, but I think at the same time we need to dismiss anemic notions of tourism sustainability altogether. If nothing else, the coronavirus pandemic has simultaneously engendered a great humbling, a reminder that we are vulnerable and powerless against forces of nature that we can't easily control, and at the same time a reminder of just what can be achieved when we are focused and purposeful. We're now out of the box, so let's think outside the box. Tourism has become lost in the elaboration of complex theories and ideologies while all the time contributing to the chronic global catastrophe. The hyper-connectedness of everything has enabled a greater reach than anything before, but it's digital and remote. There's no sacrifice involved. Websites, blogs, social platforms and legions of forums enable an overwhelming proliferation of opinions, articles and thoughts that are so fast and so seamless that we simply can't comprehend it all. Most of it is just a variation on a theme, written in front of a computer, a constant stream of comforting phrases like 2019 is going to be the tipping year for sustainable and conscious travel or change is on the way. People have lost the ability to write with dirt under their fingernails. If we want to look for original ideas, we just have to go back a few decades and read people like Rachel Carson and Wendell Berry. The vocabulary around sustainable tourism in particular has lost its power to inspire. Ecotourism, pro-poor tourism, sustainable tourism, green tourism, transformative tourism, regenerative tourism and now purposeful tourism. Papers proliferate on circular economies, sharing economies, digital economies, gig economies, socially conscious models, for-purpose income generation models, value-driven business models, social entrepreneurship models, slow travel. And nowadays there are thought leaders, tourism consultants, ego consultants, eco-warriors, brand pioneers, industry experts, change makers, sustainable tourism practitioners, social entrepreneurs, tourism gurus, and we work in sustainable tourism cooperative research centres, writing sustainable tourism blogs and linking in responsible tourism networks. The verbs are just a constant aggrandizement of a collective philosophy, engaging, activating, educating, sharing, challenging, empowering, co-creating, scaling, delivering, change-making, repurposing, collaborating. There are literally so many organisations out there reporting, analysing, criticising, measuring, lobbying, policy-making, regulating, certifying, awarding in the name of tourism. People just don't understand what all this means. Go to the villages in Nepal and ask. What they understand is the importance of community in order to survive and thrive. The danger is falling into a kind of collective solipsism where everyone believes in the crowd-based reality that has been constructed. It's not surprising, really. Humans like conformity. It's comforting to be part of the crowd, watching the crowd engage in any social behaviour. And yet, the simple truth is that every mitigation is a compromise. The challenge is to break out of this dogmatic slumber and experience some sacrifice in the status quo. We can simplify our way to perfection when there is nothing left to take away, as San Exupery said in The Little Prince. But up until now... All the stakeholders can't see beyond the current default large-scale model, even though nobody wins. A concerted effort to change has not been forthcoming, and right now there is no leadership around a single, cohesive, alternate message. And for the people who hold tourism to account, 
Most small consultancies are battling for small-scale, underfunded projects and occasional work. There are limited resources and not much meaningful collaboration. No single organisation is achieving success at scale. And meanwhile, development is just sustained growth. And economic growth trumps environmental limits. So sustainability will always remain elusive. Companies want growth to make more profits, to attract equity and restructure debt in order to grow more. Yet the sacrosanct image of authenticity is still out there under our noses. I see it thousands of times when I travel. What an ironic equation it all is. And where is the leadership for travel and tourism? Who is holding our torch? The climate crisis has been around for decades, but it took a 16-year-old Swedish student holding up a placard and a 94-year-old English naturalist to create at least some sense of public awareness and unity around our planetary plight. Suddenly, it's not about waiting for governments to sign climate agreements and accords. It's about individuals making incremental changes and, crucially, as consumers, demanding change. Not just surface stuff, but big stuff. And when people vote with their feet, businesses listen. And gradually, we will see this movement evolve from being a middle-class preserve to a global default. Gradually, the provenance of what we buy will interest everyone. Sustainable brands do have traction now after a long climb upwards as more people care about the planet. Price, quality and convenience are becoming more comparable slowly. But which tourism influencer is out there telling everybody to change the way they think of holidays? Which of you is on TikTok with 12 million followers? Because the message isn't coming from tour operators. I've been a member of trade associations for years now, and let me tell you, any commitment to sustainable development is weak. Members are just fed a sop of making a pledge or two and sharing some stories. Destinations, by and large, aren't investing in the protection of their destinations. Taxpayers' money is spent on attracting volume rather than value. Carbon offset initiatives are just another sop to deflect flight shame. The only hope is in cleaner fuels, because flying won't stop. Tourism boards can advocate for better circumstances, but ultimately don't really have control of these matters. Governments? The UNWTO? How many of you instantly had a mental shake of the head with those words? And how many places are acting to limit tourism? Well, there's just a few. Sancterre, Zion National Park, Machu Picchu, limiting the annual number of visitors... Amsterdam, Barcelona, the Seychelles and now Prague are curtailing large-scale development. Bhutan and Venice charge visitors taxes and fees. And then Koh Tachai and the similar national park is prohibiting visitation altogether. But who's telling people, no, you can't climb Mount Everest? How many dead bodies do we need to see before somebody says, damn it, no more? People say the negativity is surprising because well-managed tourism is a proven win. Surely we can fit a few more people on Everest. Well, it's not surprising at all, really, when you look at the philosophical and psychological influences. This isn't about a business case for sustainability. It's not about discussing poverty alleviation, cultural homogenization, gender equality, inequality, displacement, overcapacity or even sustainable development goals. Because, to paraphrase Bill Clinton's campaign slogan famously used to win the presidency over George Bush, it's the economy, stupid. The fixation on capital growth, on the myth of endless resources and the merry-go-round of earning more to consume more at all costs, rarely wavers. Tourism is just a symptom of the human condition. People will still clamber over dead bodies to summit their Everest. I started my business so I could indulge my passion for climbing and adventure and also to try and help people. I view it by the people I meet and the natural world, not by profit, although I'm sensible enough to run it at a profit. But that's just a money-in-money-out equation and a lesson from childhood to live within my means. The question is where will we go from here and where does the leadership come from? What's the future of tourism? Well, I can only go on what I see, 
and I've seen in 25 years of running a tour operation and what I hear from thousands of people going on my holidays and what my staff who have been with me throughout the whole time tell me. People respond to an authentic story, not some manufactured idea of what corporate leadership is meant to be. Stories mean more than data and our hard work, fair play, free-spirited attitude feels more real and authentic than any advertisement ever will. I don't compromise on what I value most, whether I'm climbing Everest or taking people up Kilimanjaro or putting my money into the people and friends I employ. I decided what growth meant to me right from the start and it was always about the people, the long-term commitment to give people careers and livelihoods, enough money for all of us, including me, to get by without stress, enough so I could climb. It's deeply important for me to know the people who manage my holidays and to use empathy to understand their needs and to use money to empower them. This is not a business model. It's just the right way to treat people. I always aim to give communities I work with the right to be a part of the tourism enterprise which they host. I could give this a fancy name, equitable distribution or something. But for me, it's just about what feels right. I aim to educate my clients about the negative impact of tourism. I try to communicate with integrity, clarity and consistency. I want them to share my responsibility to come back home with more knowledge about a place. In all my years, however, I have consistently noticed that there is an expectation of the leadership I have to exhibit from my clients and from my staff. Yet I don't know what I would do in this role without having instincts that I trust. That doesn't mean that I choose to ignore evidence and research, but actually you just can't ignore what your instincts are telling you, and nor should you. Mountain guides are taught quite specifically to trust their instincts and also to avoid those mental shortcuts that become known as heuristic traps and can be very dangerous. For example, you choose to climb across a snow-covered slope because there are some footsteps already there. So it must be safe, right? No. I think one of the dangers of leadership now is that there is so much information and so much research around the way that people think and the way that people process what they hear and how we're meant to present ourselves that you run the risk of becoming over-engineered. But that independence of thought, which my father drummed into me as a child, doesn't come without risk and sacrifice. Climbing Mount Everest without bottled oxygen was a tremendous risk to me, but I had to sacrifice comfort and convenience in order to test myself, to see if I could live up to that aesthetic that I desired. It took me 15 years of climbing, 10 months a year to reach that point, but I had to try it. It was a value that I didn't want to compromise. Tourism business is, in my opinion, driven by empathy, not on current notions of financial strength and assertiveness through unbridled growth. I've seen my opinion discounted for the sole and simple reason that my business model doesn't scale up. My response would be that the problem with tourism is big companies who can't scale down and have become too big to empathise. In fact, when you think about it, all the big challenges that we face in the world, empathy and emotional intelligence are the qualities we need the most. Leaders need to be able to empathise with the circumstances of others, to empathise with the next generation that we're making decisions on behalf of. The future of tourism has to be small and empathetic. It's not radical, but it is difficult to achieve. Getting away from the size obsession is a big challenge. Look what happens when dozens, not just dozens, but hundreds of people try to summit Everest on the same day. It's not sustainable. People die. People lose their most basic instinct for compassion. And do you know what? These qualities of empathy, caring and sharing, the ones I need to use on a mountain when we're up there in the great white beyond are the same qualities we teach in our children. At what point do these qualities become obsolete when you start working in business? One of my favourite activities here at home 
is running the forest school for the local nursery in our village and spending days in our forest with the kids. After all, if Google's main target these days are five-year-olds, then we need to be the antidote to that world our children are growing up in. We need to give them the balance they need. But it needs to start early. In the last 25 years, I've seen plenty to be confident about. But in the last three years, I've seen it speed up. Since the climate emergency has been catapulted out of the realm of government and into the public consciousness, thanks to Greta Thunberg and David Attenborough, the message is getting through. And it's not just a middle class or wealthy preserve. My client demographic covers all the bases, from economically deprived to very wealthy. Travel less, more slowly and for longer. 20 years ago, 95% of my clients joined up on scheduled dates and met like-minded strangers for their two-week holiday. 10 years ago, that had dropped to 45%. Five years ago, 95% of my clients wanted to have their own dates for their own group at the same price. And two years ago, I started getting inquiries from people wanting to travel once every two or three years on a six-week journey in order to properly understand the country and interact with people in a much more meaningful way. I can easily accommodate this change and adapt and be more versatile because the model and the ethos for me hasn't changed since 1996 when I first started guiding trips around the world. It remains the same. Stay true to your product and remember that an ethos is more than words. Always consider your customers' needs and look after your workers. Put your money where your mouth is and don't be afraid to take risks and make sacrifices. And become a leader in your own field and be your own influencer. For me, the question about the future of tourism and the radical approach we all need to take is really a question of how we manage a kind of capitalistic jiu-jitsu to consume less and to see that not as a sacrifice, but as something to be welcomed, a good thing. Fewer people on Everest is a good thing. In 1962, Bob Dylan penned a verse to Woody Guthrie about a funny old world that's a-coming along. It seems sick and it's hungry, it's tired and it's torn. It looks like it's a-dying and it's a-hardly been born. For the last 50 years, Dylan has sung about a hard rain that's going to fall, a world gone wrong. He told us everything's broken, warned us that the water was high and the levees won't hold. But everything isn't broken, it's fragile. We can let the hard rain wash us away, or we can be released. And now it's been taken out of our hands. A microscopic virus has done the job for us. Everest is closed and Nepal is closed. The mountain benefits and the humans suffer. It seems like an end, but it's also a beginning. It's an experience that can change our perspective. We might learn the art of conducting ourselves in the lower regions by the memory of what we have seen higher up. <laughs>